good evening uh, i don't see uh, duvinda rao so i'll uh, i'm happy to introduce uh, the speaker today um, i think um, prof jayalat doesn't need the introduction uh, to the audience so in fact i am uh, one of his uh, students long long time ago and those is i remember him as a very energetic uh, um uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today professor ja- tilak jayalat i think he need as a need an introduction to the audience in when i said i have been a, a student uh, of uh, professor jayalat long long time ago and at that time i think you were just come uh, for your, after your overseas training yes. and we were uh, we really remember you as a energetic and you know um, highly um, knowledgeable uh, consultant at that time and you are not lost your touch so i am sure um, the present generation also would like to uh, gain from you sir so uh, uh, today uh, prajal is going to talk about uh, mcq tips and then you and uh, those days we used to love his tips about so many things and uh, i am sure you will have a, a fruitful session over to you sir hey tushar uh, good evening everyone thank you very much tushar for those very nice words of introduction about me and i must thank uh, uh, professor tushar pudagamana the president the highly energetic president and its council uh, for inviting me to uh, make this presentation tonight i must say few words about pemsa peradiniya medical school alumni association is one organization to which i have huge respect and affection i'm requesting every one of you in this webinar to become a member later in your life so with that uh, humble request i want to start my presentation actually my presentation is uh, basically about mcq tips um i must tell you that uh, in this presentation i am not going to discuss about medicine mcqs what i want to discuss tonight is some important points about marking mcq paper general comments about how to mark mcq paper effectively and uh, also i want to make uh, I, i want to say that uh, now in this presentation sometimes you might come across difficult questions but as i said in this presentation i am not going to discuss the question and the answers what i want to tell you about the mcq technique so don't worry about your knowledge because i know that in this webinar there are students joining from various batches so do not worry about your knowledge but just concentrate more on the the essential general tips about mcq marking right now when you look at uh, mcqs you must be thinking why i decided to discuss this topic mcq tips as you know mcqs are very important part of your examination especially now um when you look at the mcq paper in the final mbbs examination you know that you have merit position in the all island uh, final mbbs the position will be decided by the mark you get in the mainly from the marks from the mcq paper now i have seen some students they fail this mcq component in the written exam due to the poor exam technique some of them are really good in their knowledge and they are really having good intelligence but still they fail the exam due to this poor exam technique the multiple choice questions choice questions are generally regarded as very reliable and very consistent and valid way of testing the knowledge of a student there is no exam in effect so this method of assessing a student student's knowledge is very effective actually as i said you know, all island merit position in the final mbbs examination mainly decided by the marks 
you get in the MCQ for your painting final MBBS examination. So you need to get a very good mark in the final MBBS examination, mainly in the MCQ paper, if you really want to have a high position in the merit list. Not only that, even when you take a postgraduate field, there are what are called selection examinations in the uh, postgraduate medical field. And there, the selection examinations are mainly conducted with MCQs. So you can see the importance of MCQ marking does not end at the level of MBBS. Even at postgraduate examination level, your knowledge will be tested in MCQ. So you need to have this real MCQ knowledge and the MCQ technique. Let's look at the final MBBS medicine component. The final MBBS medicine, this is how the marks are divided. 20 marks uh, for the MCQ paper, then the essay paper, long cases, short cases, and in-course assessment. You can see every component carries 20 marks. Uh, what about the, uh, the final MBBS medicine subject? Remember this point. If you want to pass this exam, medicine subject, you need to get 25 marks for the theory component. This includes MCQs and the essay paper. So you can compensate your low marks in MCQs and essay, but together you need uh, 45 marks to pass medicine subject in final MBBS examination. And also remember, you need 50 marks for the clinical component. I have seen very unfortunate students who, are, who had sometimes very high total mark, but they fail in this subject simply because they didn't have enough marks for the theory component and sometimes for the clinical component. So this again, this is the importance of getting a good mark in the MCQ paper. Let's look at the, uh, the composition of a final MBBS MCQ paper. There are 50 questions and you are given two hours, 120 minutes. There will be 20 true false MCQs and there will be 30 best of five MCQs. So you get 50 questions MCQs and you have to mark this paper in two hours. When you calculate the time period, it's about two and a half minutes for each MCQ question. When you look at uh, MCQs, multiple choice questions, there are several formats. The commonest is the true-false design. And in this uh, format, you get a stem or a question, and there are five answers. Each answer may be true or false. Remember, in a standard true-false design, you have a 50% chance of being right if you make a guess. Let's look at a question with this uh, format. This is a typical true-false question. The following are features of hypothyroidism. The answers are deafness, hirsutism, ataxia, epiphyseal dysgenesis, and menorrhagia. When you look at this question, you can see B is not correct because in hypothyroidism, we don't expect hirsutism. It's mainly the loss of hair, sometimes scalp or eyebrows. But other answers are correct. So you can see A, C, D, E correct. B, E, false. B answer is false. So this is a typical true-false MCQ question. In my presentation, hereafter I'll be discussing mainly about the best of five questions. These are difficult compared to true false questions. And these questions are mainly based on clinical scenarios. And when you look at the question, you can find 
the answers are very much similar. So it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate these answers and to find the correct answer among these five answers. So that's why I thought I will pay more attention to this difficult component of best of five questions in this presentation. I said in the true false MCD questions, you have a 50% chance of guessing, but look at the best of five, the chance is only 20%. When you compare true, false, and best of five questions, in the true, false component or uh, format, in true, false format, your knowledge on theory knowledge is tested mainly. But in the best of five questions, the knowledge in the clinical subjects tested mainly. So you can see the main difference True, false, testing more on the theory knowledge, and the best of five, checking more on the clinical knowledge. I think uh, before you go to the exam, you must be familiar with the marking scheme. There are two ways these MCQ papers are marked. I'm mainly referring to the uh, true, false format, because in the best of five format, only one answer is correct. If you give the mark, a correct answer, you get full mark. If not, you don't get any mark. But in the uh, true false format, you get mainly the negative marking. Remember, this negative marking is very important. The negative marking is given within the questions. To explain more, now we know that each of these uh, two first questions, you get five answers. And in your questions, there are A, B, C is correct, D and E is incorrect. And so there are three correct, two incorrect. But if you mark it correctly, you get five marks. But remember, if you mark your question as three incorrect, and two correct, you don't get a single mark. But if you mark three correct, two incorrect, you are left with one mark. So this is what is called a negative marking. And the purpose of this negative marking is to uh, discourage students guessing in the exam. So you must be familiar with this marking scheme in your exam. Let's look at a typical best of five question. There are three components in these questions. You get a stem, then there's a correct answer, and there are four distractors. So these distractors are very much similar to the correct answer. Sometimes in a typical best of five question, it's not easy to find the correct answer, so difficult. So that's why they are known as distractors. And one more point I want to stress at this moment, to minimize guessing in a good question, the answers are arranged in the alphabetical order like this. Look at this question. A 33-year-old female with uh, SLE having facial rash and the rash on trunk. So this patient has mainly the skin involvement and there is no involvement of kidneys because no proteins, no hematuria. Which of the following medications is most appropriate? So here, your knowledge on the treatment of SLE is tested. There are five answers. When you look at the answers, you can see the answers are arranged in the alphabetical order. A, C, H, M, P. This is to avoid guessing. The answer is actually hydroxychloroquine because this is the drug we use in clinical practice. When you get a patient with SLE, mainly with a skin involvement. So don't worry about the knowledge here. But what I want to stress is 
the answers are arranged in the alphabetical order. Right. I said a typical best of five question. There are three components: the stem, the correct answer, and the last one is the last part is the distractors. Look at when you look at the stem. The stem can be a statement, or sometimes you get a brief case description, or sometimes you are given results or investigations. Sometimes you are given an ECG, and you are asked to interpret, and there are five answers. And also a photograph, chest X-ray or image can be given, and there there will be five answers. So let's take each of these. Um, stem separately. This is a statement. You are asked to examine a patient with chronic liver cell disease (CLCD). Which of the following signs suggest you of CLCD? So there are five answers. Look at answers: ankle swelling, hyperpigmentation, loss of axillary hair, palm erythema, spider neem. We all we know that all these answers are correct. But which one is highly suggestive? The answer is E. So this is a typical example of a best of five question with a statement. No details about the patient, and no investigations, no clinical findings. Next one. I said sometimes you get questions with set of investigations. So this is a typical best of five question with. Set of investigation: a patient with rheumatoid arthritis on treatment penicillin. The patient comes with weakness and anemia, and the patient thinks that these side effects are due to sorry these uh, symptoms are due to side effect of the drug. And these are the investigations. Look at the investigations. Hemoglobin is only five grams, and there is leukopenia, and there is thrombocytopenia. So this patient who is having rheumatoid arthritis on penicillin now having we call it pancytopenia. So we have to find out what's the condition producing pancytopenia among these five answers. So when you look at the answers, the answer is aplastic anemia. We know that in aplastic anemia you can get pancytopenia. Sometimes this could be due to some drugs. We, we use in clinical practice. I said sometimes in the best of five questions, you are given questions based on a case, a clinical scenario, and there are no other information. Now look at this question. Here you have a 63-year-old man admitted with severe recurrent attacks of abdominal pain, central abdominal pain, and this pain radiates to both hypochondria. And the patient occasionally has vomiting. He is a heavy smoker, and he takes alcohol. Also, this patient complains of significant weight loss, and the patient has polyuria and polydipsia. On examination, he has no signs of chronic liver cell disease and no palpable masses. So, what is the best investigation to confirm the diagnosis? Now, before you answer this question. You need to find out what is the most likely diagnosis. There are two possibilities. Now, this patient is taking alcohol, heavy smoke. It could the patient could be having chronic gastritis or chronic pancreatitis, coming with acute exacerbations. So these are the two possibilities. But when you hear about this information that the patient is having weight loss and there is polyuria and polydipsia. Probably this patient is now developing type three diabetes. So, in a patient with type three diabetes, most likely this patient could be having chronic pancreatitis. So, look at this question. There are no data, no investigation, but only the clinical case. And look at the answers to diagnose chronic pancreatitis. The best investigation among these five answers is the last one. Ultrasound scan of the abdomen might reveal that the patient is having pancreatic calcification. So this is a good example of a best of five question with a clinical case. 
let's go to the ECG. I said in the best of five question, you can get ECG as the stem. So this is a good example. This is the ECG of a young man presenting with left sided chest pain and the patient, there is history of trauma. And on examination, there is tenderness. So most likely this patient has muscular pain, probably due to the trauma he sustained. And a young man, you don't expect pathological changes in this patient. And what are the, <clears throat> I mean, sorry, when you look at the answers, there are, now the abnormality in this ECG is, there is ST elevation. There is ST elevation. And uh, no, when you look at the causes of ST elevation, all these conditions can produce ST elevation. Acute myocardial infarction, acute pericarditis, early repolarization, hyperkalemia, left bundle branch block. So all these conditions can produce ST elevation in ECG. But when you look at the history and also when you look at the ECG, you can't see the changes of the acute myocardial infarction and no evidence of pericarditis, no other evidence of hyperkalemia or left bundle branch block. The answer is early repolarization. So this is a typical best of five question with an ECG. You go to the last one. I said in the best of five question, you can get image or check x-ray or image of a patient. This is the optic fundus of a patient who presented with severe headache. So what is the abnormality here? The abnormality is the patient has a papilledema. There is papilledema, right? So when you look at the causes of papilledema, all these conditions can produce papilledema. But what is the most likely diagnosis? Then you can see this patient, in addition to the papilledema, there is narrowing of blood vessels and there are some exudates. So the condition where you get papilledema and uh, narrowing of blood vessel, the typical condition is malignant hypertension. So you can see the correct answer is malignant hypertension. So now with these uh, five questions, I wanted to stress the various patterns of best of five questions you get in exams. It could be a statement, it could be a set of investigations, you can get a clinical scenario like what I gave you, and also an ECG or any image, and the questions can be around the stem. So be familiar with these questions. Now we come to the preparation part, right? How to prepare? If you want to do well in your exam, MCQ component, my advice is you must do as many as exam, MCQs you can gather. You can gather these MCQs from various sources. So go through these various MCQs and be familiar with a type of question you get. And also I want to tell you, never memorize these answers. As an examiner, a clinical examiner, I must tell you, we have never repeated MCQs in clinical exams, final MBBS examination. We always create new MCQs. So there is no point memorizing answers. What is important in, this, uh, in these MCQs is the factual knowledge. You must gain by reading around the MCQ question and it has to be a very deep knowledge. And also you must be familiar with the topics. You know, when you look at the MCQ paper, there are some common topics and these topics can recur frequently in the exams. So you should be very familiar with common topics which are seen in exams repeatedly and be familiar and to have a deeper knowledge in these areas. It's always better to revise with your friends and the colleagues about your technique and your knowledge. While you are doing MCQs, you can share your knowledge and the technique with your colleagues and you can correct yourselves. And also you should know what type of MCQs you are given in the exam. Now I said, in the final MBBS examination, you get 
22 false, 30 best of 5. You are familiar with that. And also you must know the time period, how much, the, what's the time duration in the final MBBS examination. You are given two hours. And also you must know about, you must know about the negative marking. That's very important. So having prepared with all these methods that I discussed, now we come to the exam. When you come to the exam on the day of your examination, always calculate the time. We know that in the final MBBS medicine paper, you are given two hours. And you know that there are 50 questions and each question you are having two and a half minutes. So that of course you should know before you start your paper. And also when you mark your paper, there are easy questions and there are difficult questions. So you should not be delayed by any single questions. What you can do is you start marking. Once you start marking the paper, you go on marking. You do the easy one first. Because generally, it's believed that the first answer you get in the first instance, mostly correct. So the chance of be, those questions becoming um, incorrect is less. So you can start with, because in, I have seen um, the students, some students are very familiar. Now, some are very good in cardiology, some are good in nephrology, likewise. So you must identify your easy areas. And there are questions in each, in the exam, there are many areas are tested. So you do a question and do these questions first, the easy ones, and you mark these difficult ones and you come back. Now, when you come back to the difficult question that you marked while you are doing the easy ones, again, you go through these cases. And again, look for this, uh, go through these questions in detail. And sometimes at the end, you have to make a guess. I will tell you how to make a guess in these difficult questions. Now, I said on the day, allocate a period at the end to checking answers. Now, this is very important. Now, I have been an examiner in the final MBBS medicine paper for so many years. I have seen some students in the exam. Sometimes they don't have enough time to enter the correct answer to the answer sheet. So they struggle. As examiners, we can't give additional time. Sometimes, I mean, without, we don't like, but we have to collect the answer sheet without answers. So make sure that you have some time you left at the end of your marking to enter this uh, correct answer to the answer sheet. So that's very important. And remember, you will not be penalized for guessing, and we will discuss how to make this guessing at the end. And also very important point in the final MBBS examination. Now in true false questions, there are five. When you are not sure, please do not mark it. You can leave it blank. Now there are five answers. If you know that only A, B, C is correct, you can mark only A, B, C. You can leave D and E blank you will not be penalized for not marking. So that's very important in the exam. Right, now, uh, now we come to the, uh, the knowledge. Now, that's all about the method and how to do is. Now, when you look at the knowledge, I said, to mark your MCQ paper in an effective way, you must have a good knowledge. That's the most important one. Those students who are having a good knowledge, they normally do well in the exam. So this knowledge can be divided into two, two types of knowledge, fingertip knowledge and hidden knowledge. Now the fingertips, you don't need to work around. That's the solid knowledge. You read, say, for diabetes, you know diabetes, there are macrovascular complications, three macrovascular complications, and there are three microvascular complications. These are, this is what is called a solid knowledge. And the question can be around that. If you know that the question is based on that, you can mark it without any 
difficulty. Now look at this question. A 40-year-old lady with chronic discomfort in the left upper quadrant in the abdomen. So that looks like this patient is having enlarged spleen because the most important organ in the uh, left upper quadrant is the spleen. So this patient probably having enlarged spleen. And look at the investigations. The patient has high hemoglobin level, high white cell count, and the platelet count is high. So what's the diagnosis? We have only one diagnosis. A patient with enlarged spleen with high hemoglobin level, high white cell count, and high platelet count, the diagnosis is polycythemia. So the answer is primary polycythemia. So this is called fingertip knowledge. There is no way to, you don't need to argue, these are solid facts. What about this question? Now, this is a question I will discuss. Then I said, in addition to the fingertip knowledge, you, there is something called hidden knowledge. The hidden knowledge is where you have to work out, actually. You have to work out on your basic principles, and you apply your basic principles to get the correct answer. Look at this question. A 35-year-old woman with anxiety is hyperventilating acutely. And what do you expect in the blood gases? Now this patient, we know that with hyperventilation, there is a possibility of loss of carbon dioxide. So when you lose carbon dioxide, what happens is the bicarbonate will join with hydrogen ion in the arterial blood. So the result, what you get is reduced hydrogen, hydrogen ion in the blood initially. Later, there is a chance of getting low bicarbonate acid. But in the initial period, this is what you expect. Now, when you look at this question, now you can see, now this is what's called hidden knowledge. You apply your basic principles and then you select the correct answer. So the knowledge is either fingertip knowledge or hidden knowledge. Before I discuss uh, this area, we call them clues. Any questions up to now? Uh, am I going fast or going slow? Please, students. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yeah. Uh, Tushar, no, you are also there now. Tushar, I am, should I be more interactive? What do you think? I can make it more interactive? Uh, uh, I think you are, you are fine, sir. But generally, uh, in the chat box, they usually um, send their questions. Or, yeah. you know, but I don't, I don't see anything. There so is only far. one. one. Yeah, uh, because at the end, we will have a discussion, Tushar. Eh? Is yes, it okay right, yeah. if I proceed like this? Please, yes. Let's yes. have a discussion yes. later on. Yeah, sure looks like yeah. it's okay, sir. Yes. I find the students are still there, almost 300. So let's yes, go. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so good. Right. So now we come to the, one of the most important areas in MCQ marking. I, we call them clues. Remember, when you are marking your MCQ uh, paper, these clues are very important to get a good mark. I will discuss each one separate. These are what are known as clues in MCQ paper. Very important area the students should know. The meaning of each of these are very important. I say you get this question, characteristic. The meaning is you doubt about the diagnosis without this sign. Then you get questions commonly. Commonly means the chance of getting that uh, answer is more than 50%. Then you get questions, pathognomonic. That means this abnormality occurs only in that disease in no other condition. Then you get questions recognized. That means at least even one case has been reported. Similarly, you get a specific. It's, it's very much similar to pathognomonic. Then the typical, typical means same as characteristic. Some questions you can get this essential feature. That means you need this abnormality to make the diagnosis. Or else you get questions, occurs. There can be one or two cases, but still the answer is correct. 
Rare means less than 5%. Almost never means 1% to 2%. I will take each one separate and explain in detail. Look at this question. And before that, you may come across these words frequently, likely, mostly, and usually. The meaning is more than 50%, similar to commonly. Right. Look at this question. The characteristic physical sign in mitral stenosis. I said, without this, you doubt about the diagnosis. Loud for start sum, yes, you can get it. Mid-diastolic murmur, you can get it. Opening snap, you can get it. Pre-systolic accentuation is possible, or can get tapping apex beat. So when you look at the answer, the answer is tapping. The tapping apex beat is the characteristic physical sign in mitral stenosis. You don't find any other condition to get tapping apex beat. So that's the meaning of characteristic. What about the commonly? I said the meaning of commonly is more than 50%. Which of the following ECG abnormalities commonly seen in pulmonary embolism? All the answers are correct. Right bundle branch block pattern, right axis deviation, sinus tachycardia, supraventral tachycardia, T inversion. All these signs can be seen, but the commonest remember is the sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia is seen in most cases. So the answer is this. All the answers are correct, but can be seen, but commonly means more than 50%. The answer is sinus tachycardia. Right, move to the second one. I said pathognomonic means only seen in that condition. Which of the following signs are pathognomonic of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Barrel-shaped chest, pulses paradoxes, first tip breathing, short trachea, use of excessive muscles. When you look at this answer, you can get all of these signs in COPD, but the pathognomonic one is the barrel-shaped chest. So that's, that's the typical question to discuss this pathognomonic uh, word. I said recognize. Recognize even if there is one case, the answer is correct. Look at this question. Recognized complication of COVID shield vaccine. We know that there were a few cases recently. Some patients are developing cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Now, and so this is actually, uh, it's actually a true false question because you can't have a best of five with this, but you can see even all these are correct. We know that the COVID shield vaccine can produce even the cerebral venous thrombosis. There were a few cases. So this is what is meaning by recognize. Even with few cases, you can mark it as correct. Then to stress this point, the word specific, that is only seen in this condition, no other condition. Typhoid, which of the following is specific to the typhoid fever? What a tongue, yes. Dicotic pulse, yes. Intestinal perforation can be seen. Raw spots, yes. Soft spleen. So we know that in clinical medicine, all the signs are correct. But the one which is specific to the typhoid fever is the raw spots. So this is this is MCQ to stress this point about specific sign. More next one is the typical. I said another question, another way of asking question, a clue in uh, MCQ paper is. A typical word, typical. Typical means only in that, typical of that condition. Now, ankylosing spondylitis, typical fetus, apical fibrosis is possible, arterial regurgitation, then the enthesitis is possible, peripheral arthritis is possible, uveitis. All these are possible, you can get, but remember the answer is C. So this is an example of a best of five question stressing the importance of having this clue, a typical, the word typical. 
I said essential. Now, without this point, sorry, without this uh, abnormality, you doubt about the diagnosis. That's the meaning of essential. A patient with Guillain-Barr syndrome, which of the following is an essential sign? Look at these answers. Ascending paralysis, autonomic symptoms, bilateral symptoms, decreased reflexes, and the high protein content in CSF. When you look at these answers, all these answers are correct. But which one is the essential one? The essential one is the decreased or absent reflexes. When you get a patient presenting with typical flexic paralysis, when the patient has decreased reflexes or absent reflexes, you have to think of Guillain-Barr syndrome. So this is a question to stress this word, essential feature. I said, sometimes you get questions, rare. The word rare is included in the question. And this is, that means less than 5%. Which of the following is a rare sign of acute traumatic fever? We all know that in acute traumatic fever, erythema marginatum can be seen, high fever can be seen, migratory arthritis can be seen, rheumatic carditis can be seen, and sedan hemoscopy. All these are seen, but erythema marginatum is not a common one. According to the literature, this is a sign which is seen in less than 5%. So the answer is this. The meaning of rare is this. Right. Then I said, the mean, what's, you get this question with it, it has this word occurs. So this is the MCQ to highlight the importance of this word. Which of the following occurs with metformin treatment? This is the best of five answers. Now there are acute kidney injury. We don't talk about acute kidney injury with metformin treatment. Then acute pancreatitis, we don't hear about this. Chronic kidney disease, that is the myth in the population. As students, you all know that CKD is not due to metformin, but we take precautions in a patient with CKD and we adjust the dosage of metformin. Chronic liver cell disease, again, not due to metformin, but in a patient with CLCD or cirrhosis, we have to adjust the dosage. Vitamin B12, B12 deficiency. When you look at this, you know, the vitamin B12, there have been few cases of vitamin B12 deficiency. So the answer is this. Even with a single case, you have to mark it as correct. So this is the uh, meaning of the word occurs in MCQ paper as a clue. Right. There are a few other clues actually you get in the MCQ paper. These words, you get to never, always, exclusively. The meaning is there are no exceptions um, in those situations. You may come across these words in the MCQ paper, could, possible, and may. The meaning is may apply under certain circumstances. Right. What about your response? When you get a question which has maybe, may, can be, can appear, is possible, generally, these questions, these answers are correct, not always. Generally, maybe, may, can be, can appear, is possible, these responses are correct. What about other words? When you get questions with answers always, necessarily, never, same as, in general, these answers are false. So make sure that when you mark these answers, generally, always, necessarily, never and same as, they are false responses. Right. Now we come to the last part of my presentation, how to answer the best of five question effectively. This is the most important part, having considered how to prepare 
how to go through the question uh, and the various components and the clues in your question and the answer. Now we come to the important part, how to answer the question in effective way. This is what I recommend. Always read the stem, covering the answer. That's very important because if you read the stem and jump into the answers, sometimes you may be misled by the answers in the answer area. So my advice is just cover the answers and read the stem. Find out your answer, possible answer. See whether your answer is among the five responses. And if there is no answer among the responses, then you have to go through it again. And then you go for this least likely to most likely. So that's how we should uh, mark. I will give you a good example. Now look at this question. This is about a patient who comes with a typical Guillain-Barr syndrome. The patient has um, um, symmetrical weakness of both sides of the face and the muscles of the extremities. Sensor is absolutely normal and there are no deep tendon reflexes. So it's an easy question, but you can see there are some other import, some other points in this case scenario. They have given about temperature, the blood pressure, the pulse, respiration is. Sometimes these are important and sometimes they are of no significance. Now, when you look at this question, this is a patient with Pilumbari syndrome. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So there are five answers. So my advice is now, when you get a question like this, do not look at the answers, go through the stem. A 32 year old man with a short history, progressive weakness, he has been healthy, and had a preceding respiratory infection, high temperature, blood pressure is normal, pulse is basically normal, respiration is high, and he has symmetrical weakness of the face and the proximal muscles. No deep tendon reflexes, the plant. Now, when you go through this stem, I think it's an easy question, you have only one answer. The answer is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now we look at the question and then go to the answer, see whether your answer is there. Yes, there you find your answer and you mark it as correct. But imagine if you, without concentrating on this area, you read the entire part, sometimes you may be misled by these answers. So in a question like this, a typical best of five question, now look at our question, now we know that our answer is B, most correct answer. And there are four other answers. We call them distractors. These answers are there to distract you from the correct answer. Now you can see D is the least likely. This is not a case with poly poliomyelitis. C, yes, myasthenia gravis is bit again very unlikely. A is possible, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. E. There is a chance because the patient has muscle weakness, the chance of this patient having poliomyelitis is high. So the most correct one is the B, the next most, the next, the close to the correct answer is E, but D is very unlike. So this is how you arrange your distractors from least correct to most correct. So you should be able to do it in the exam in a difficult case where you can't find the correct answer. But in your question, this is an easy question. So you can straight away go for the B, right? So this is how you mark the um, typical best of five question. Now, I want to say a few things about this word, VNET. VNET. VNET is, the, is actually, you come across this word in clinical medicine. It's like a clinical scenario. The word VNET is a short description of a short event, uh, event in your life. In French words, it's called, uh, uh, it's a French word actually. And uh, the, you pronounce it as VNET. 
and the vnet means the clinical scenario and you have seen some question that i have done in this presentation and there were nice case scenarios and they are known as patient vnet so these are the typical uh, parts in the vnet normally you are given the age gender this is how you put age and the gender a 45 year old man then the site of care normally comes to the emergency department and to the medical ward so that's given and the presenting complaint is there always maybe headache abdominal pain backache then the duration you are given and about other details about family history the patient history physical findings are given sometimes or some cases no physical findings only the history but these are the essential or rather commonly given information in a typical patient we need age gender site of care presenting complaint duration patient history physical findings that sometimes you get the diagnostic studies results of investigations and occasionally you are given the treatment given initial treatment so this is uh, these are the information you get in a typical vignette now this is an example for a classical patient vignette a 45 year old man presents to the emergency care unit with severe headache for two days there were no similar episodes examination the blood pressure is 220 by 120 mm optic fundi has bilateral papillary edema so this patient has definite evidence of malignant hypertension his ecg is having changes of left ventricular hypertrophy what is the immediate step in the management so this patient the immediate step in the management is giving parenteral drugs to control his high blood pressure so this is a typical example for this patient vignette now the now this uh, question sometimes you get in the exam may not have any vignette no vignette just set of investigations or you get a short vignette or a vignette which is very long we'll take one by one look at this question now this one has no vignette straight away the examiner is asking you the most likely renal abnormality in children with nephrotic syndrome with normal renal function so look at this question there are no information about there is no information about the patient other details straight away the examiner is asking you the most likely renal abnormality in children with nephrotic syndrome the answer is the minimal change we all know that the answer is this now this the same question can be given with a short vignette now look at this a two year old boy one week is to edema that pressure is on the low side and there is generalized edema with the scientists serum investigations normal creatinine albumin is very low cholesterol is very high and there is protein in urine but no blood the most likely diagnosis same question with some information this is called a short vignette and the, you can see the answer is again the minimal nephrotic syndrome you can make it more longer than this the same questions you can add more details this scope this is called a long vignette a 2 year old black child developed swelling of his eyes and ankles that pressure is 100 by 60 there is tachycardia respiration is 28 per minute there is swelling of eyes and pitting edema abdomen is distended and the investigations are normal so you can see the same question with more details so you are so there is a possibility of getting all these patterns you may get questions without vignette or with a short vignette or you can get questions with a long vignette so be ready to face all these questions in the exam right 
Now probably we have come to the last few slides in my presentation. Now, when you look at these best of five questions, you have seen in after the STEM, there are ways of asking question. We call it leading questions. This is how these questions are asked. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for these findings? Now you can get questions like this when your knowledge is tested tested on a mechanism of a disease. Similarly, you may be asked about the likely location of the patient lesion, or you may be asked about the most likely pathogen. So when, so these are the questions around uh, the mechanism of the disease. So sometimes you can get uh, following findings is most likely to be increased or decreased. A biopsy is most likely to show which of the following. So these are the type of questions or so leading questions you get in uh, mechanism of disease. This is example about the mechanism of disease. A 10 year old girl develops prosimenturia 14 days after a sore throat. She has blood pressure 170, 100, which is high, and there is edema, pre edema, and there is a urea level is 3.2. Which of the following is the most likely cause? What about the answer is actually the most likely cause for this abnormality is intravascular volume expansion. So this is a typical question, a best of five question to test your knowledge about mechanism of a disease. So do not worry about the theory knowledge here, but what I want to highlight is the type of questions you get in the exam. This is a typical best of five question on mechanism of disease. Then you get questions sometimes in the exam, best of five questions about diagnosis. Commonly, these are the ways these questions are asked. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Or you get questions, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in diagnosis? Or which of the following is most likely to confirm the diagnosis? I have some examples I will show you after this, uh, these slides, right? Right. So this is a typical best of five question to test your knowledge about diagnosis. A man, 52 years, coming with dyspnea and cough, parulant, parulant production, a cough with parulant sputum. He's a smoker and he has temperature 32. Bed sounds, are, um, bed sounds are distant with few ronchi. Leukocyte count is about 9,000. And uh, so he has numerous neutrophils and gram negative diplococci. So the X-ray films of chest X-ray shows hyperinflation. So it like, looks like a normal chest X-ray. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So probably the answer is bronchitis because the X-ray is normal. So this is a typical question to test your knowledge about the diagnosis, right? Another question. This is, you can see these questions can have a very long vignette. Now you can see, now this question has a very long one. A 28 year old woman has palpitation. That took approximately once a week and there is palpitation and the episode start and stop suddenly. And she drinks two to three cups of coffee. She rarely drinks alcohol and does not smoke. Her blood pressure is 120, 88. A state, a stare and the lead leg are noted. The gland is firm and larger. There is a mid-systolic click and the apex, and there is a murmur, early systolic murmur. And ECG is normal except for a sinus tachycardia. So which of the following is the most appropriate next step in diagnosis? So this patient is having evidence of thyrotoxicosis. Enough evidence. Next step is now we want to confirm the diagnosis. 
Now that we do with measurement of serum thyroid stimulating hormone level. So that's how, that's the answer for this, right. Now we, uh, I think I have about another 10, slide, 10, 10, 10 slides left. So in these slides, I will give you a typical best of five questions with various ways of asking these questions. Now we start with this one a typical best of five question. In hypopituitism, what is the first hormone to be affected? Now here they're asking the first hormone to be affected. We know that all these hormones can be affected, but you should know the answer. Which one is affected first? So when you look at the answers, the answer is TSH. So there are all these Hormones can be affected, but this is the answer. Or else now, in a patient with a scientist with splenomegaly, which sign mostly supports chronic liver cell disease? Look at this question. Which sign mostly support chronic liver cell disease? Ankle swelling, hyperpigmentation, palm erythema, spider knee, white nails. You can expect every sign in patients with CLCD, but the one which is suggestive of CLCD is spider knee. Now, there is another question. A patient with severe headache, bilateral papilledema, and the CT brain is normal. And what is the next step? So this is another way of asking question in the exam. Next step in the management. Now this patient with severe headache, with papilledema, and the CT is normal. So most likely this patient is having idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We call it benign intracranial hypertension. The answer is perform CS of manometry. So you can see this is one way of asking or rather testing your knowledge in clinical medicine, what is the next step? Sometimes you get questions like this. Which of the following um, supports or favors Crohn's disease than ulcerative colitis? Constipation, diarrhea, perianal fistula, rectal bleeding, and weight loss. Normally the fistulas are more in favor of Crohn's disease. So this is a way of asking questions to sub test your knowledge. Which of the following favors one disease over the other disease? Sometimes straight away you are given questions with some information. You are asked about a diagnosis. A young patient is having inverted P wave in L1 and TOLR in V1. So this is very easy. When you get this combination, P, inverted P in L1 and TOLR in V1, the diagnosis is dextrocardia. So this is the most common type to get in exams. You are asked about what's the diagnosis. Sometimes you get questions like this. Which of the following is a characteristic feature? I said the meaning of characteristic means without this, you doubt about the diagnosis. Exopalmus in Graves disease, leukonychia in cirrhosis, cholinochia in iron deficiency, raw spots, raw spots in typhoid, and splinter hemorrhages in infective endocarditis. The answer is this. I discussed this in, the, uh, uh, in my presentation early. So this is the answer, the characteristic feature. Right. Sometimes you get questions like this. Which of the following best describes hepatorenal syndrome. Elevated AST with normal during full report. Reduced serum albumin with high serum creatine. Shankran liver with uh, reduced urine output. Severe jaundice with uh, elevated serum creatine. Hepatic encephalopathy with elevated blood duria. So the answer is the last one. So you get asked questions like this. So do not worry about your knowledge. 
in these questions, what I want to stress is the pattern, the type of best of five questions you get in the exam. This is another way. You get some questions, and here you asked about the least likely diagnosis. Least likely. Generally, these are not good questions, but in the exam, you can get. Least likely, likely, the less chance of having this. Postapococcal, diffuse proliferative, uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis, membrane nephritis, and the membrane proliferative. The most likely is the membranous. Membrane nephritis, we do not accept. Ex expect uh, complement abnormalities, but in other conditions you can. So least likely means all the other answers are correct except this one. You get questions like this. The presence of which one of the following features is most useful in distinguishing chronic kidney disease uh, from acute kidney injury. So when you look at this question, you can see anemia is there, dilute turing with high sodium, hypocalcemia, renal osteodystrophy, and Jesus. Remember, the most important one is the renal osteodystrophy. Anemia can be seen, dilute turing with high sodium can be seen, hypocalcemia can be seen, even convulsions can be seen, but when you see renal osteodystrophy, you answer is CKD. So this is one way of asking this best of five question, the most helpful. Sometimes you get questions like this, what's the most appropriate investigation? You are given the case, and based on the case, the examiner asks you, what is the most appropriate investigation to arrive at the definite diagnosis? You are given several answers. You need to select the most appropriate one. So this patient has uh, probably with uh, uh, pulmonary embolism with this history, the best investigation to diagnose pulmonary embolism is CT pulmonary angiogram. So you can see with these examples, there are various ways the questions can be set. Questions can be uh, given in the MCQ paper. And to go through this, in addition to what I discussed with questions, sometimes you get uh, stems and the leading questions like this. Which of the following would most suggest you of a diagnosis? So you get what is the best treatment modality, or else you get the most appropriate treatment. Sometimes you can get questions with most likely explanation, or else you are given questions with a drug combination which drug combination is most effective in the management of a case. Or sometimes the examiner will give a question asking about most likely cause for the symptoms. Or else you asked about the investigation that would be most useful. Or what is the important feature to suggest the organ involvement or appropriate immediate step or most appropriate treatment. So you can see there are various ways of asking the questions in the best of five. My advice is better to be familiar with all these things. Right. Last few slides. So having done this, sometimes you are clueless in the exam. So what to do? So absolutely, absolutely clueless. You don't know the answer. Then you must guess. This is how you guess. I said... The responses that use absolute words like always, never, they are not correct. And also the words like usually and probably, they are not correct. And sometimes in the exam, you get questions with funny responses and they are not correct. And when you get all of the above, generally they are correct, right? None of the above is usually an incorrect response. And also, when you look at the answers, you can find some answers are longer than the others. Generally, when you are clueless, when you have no answer, think about this. The longest response sometimes can be the correct one because the examiner wants to put more details to put into that answer and make it longer. So you can make a good guess 
in that case. Sometimes you can get questions with uh, repeating of the stem and the, some words in the stem are seen in the answer. So when you are clueless, think about that answer, that answer may be correct. Well, well, what about the A, B, C, D, E, I said, the answers are arranged in alphabetical order to avoid guessing, right? But this is not always correct. Generally, it's believed that when you are really clueless, B or C sometimes can be correct, right? A is usually very, very unlikely to be correct. So in a clueless situation, think about this also, right? Right. So we, I come to the last slide. Always read the instruction carefully. Read the instruction and read about the time and uh, about the instruction and what you asked, you should know in the answering. Read the question carefully. Always space. I said in the final MBBS examination, you are given two hours, 50 questions. Each question is two and a half minutes. You need to pace yourself properly. And also at the end, allow some time to enter your marks into the mark sheet. Um, otherwise, you may not have enough time to uh, uh, mark the answer sheet. The last sentence I want to say, the broader and deeper your knowledge, the better you will. So there is no alternative for this. My last advice is, if you really want to perform very well in the exam, please read around MCQs. Do not memorize them and do as many as MCQs, whatever source you can get and be ready with these MCQs, then you can do well in the exam. So thank you very much. That's all I want to say. Any questions? And uh, yes. yeah, there is one yes. question there, sir. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Uh, chat box. Best investigation is asked, and the most likely answer for that is not usually practiced in Sri Lanka. Is it okay to mention the answer? Yeah, mm, I think the answer is uh, I have to always think about. The ideal situation. Yeah, I think am I correct to share in this uh, this type of questions? No, we have to think about the ideal situation because the examiner wants to, your knowledge about the ideal situation. Sometimes we don't yeah, practice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. sometimes these things we are not practicing, but you need to think about the ideal situation in you know, when you answer a question like this. So, so Shara, there are no questions. Either my lecture was Hopeless, they didn't understand a single word. Also, uh, can very I, clear. I don't know. This is, this yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. is it ever possible in, in a true false question? Is it ever possible yeah. to get all the responses true or all the responses false? Yes. Why not? All can be correct, all can be incorrect. Okay. So I'm sure in the... pediatrics we give same. Yeah, I mean, so all the answers can be correct. All the answers oh, yeah. Be correct. True, it's yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes. Any other question? I think what's the time now? Yeah. 917. I'm happy that there are about 284 students still remaining. Good. Yeah. There's some more, some more questions, sir. Yeah. Some more questions. Yeah. We'll... Uh, in the, in, the, in the chat box, there are some, uh, some more yeah, questions for you. If it is mentioned rarely or sometimes, do they have both have similar meaning? Rarely or sometimes? No. I think rarely means less than about 5%. Um, uh, sometimes. Shad, what do you think about this? Rarely or sometimes? Do they have the same meaning? Um, I not the same meaning. Rise very less chance, about 2%. Right? And what about the other one? Can't we mark the answer? Sorry, can't see. So in the SDA question, are we supposed to answer according to the word management? Yeah, I think uh, this is what I said. Uh, when you're answering questions, always think about the ideal situation. 
because these questions are based on ideal situation. But sometimes you get questions, if the question says Sri Lankan situation, yes. Now say, now, now a question like this, uh, TB pericarditis. Now you may be given causes of TB pericarditis in Sri Lanka, sorry, no, peric acute pericarditis. In Sri Lanka, the commonest, one of the commonest is tuberculosis. But that's, this is not correct for the uh, Western world. So likewise, if the question is based on Sri Lankan setup, think about our setup. If not, you must say that you must thinking, you must be thinking of the ideal setup, ideal world, when you answer a question like that. If they say best, most appropriate management, does it mean the definitive treatment or the next? So the question. Uh, uh, so what? What's what's the meaning of ideal setup? Ideal stuff is you have all the facilities, and this is what you should do. Like in the Western world, if we are clueless, is there any advantage of marking all the stems as true or stems as false? Mm. Advantage of marking all the stems as true as false. I don't know. I don't uh, <laughs> encourage that. Tushar, what do you think uh, now that question? Okay. Mm. I don't encourage that. Uh, if some clinical features are given and the best diagnosis is asked, we are stuck with two responses. In that case, we have to go for the best one. So this is the typical uh, pattern you get in best of five question. Best of five question, the answers are more, if, if it is a good best of five question, the answers are generally very much similar. So you have to go for the best one among your answers. So that's how we answer these questions. The other question? You can ask actually as, why don't you ask this question uh, those who are in the chat box? Yeah, you are most welcome to ask question, please. You can unmute your mouth. My mic can uh, uh, please ask question, please. I'm happy to answer rather than uh, sending it in the chat box. Right, um, so looks like uh, no questions. Uh, there's one coming in the chat box. Uh, any English word that we don't know the meaning? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Now, actually, now in the exam, if we are not sure about the English word, we are there to help you. You can ask the invigilator the meaning of that. So within the limited uh, uh, framework, we can give you an answer, but we can't explain in detail. Most invigilators will help you in the exam when you are uh, finding it difficult to understand English words. Should we practice and learn? Uh, so many questions coming. Uh, yes. Do we need to know the normal values? Normally, uh, I think, no, we don't expect you to remember because uh, in the exam, we give values. No, you don't, need, you, don't need, you don't need to memorize, but it's better to have some idea about commonly done administration like serum creatinine. We know that it's around one milligram. So one milligram per deciliter. So likewise, it's always better to have an idea about the common investigation normal ranges, but you don't need to memorize. In the exam, you are given the normal values in the equation. Right, anything else? Uh, some literatures in guidelines and standard books are contradictory to each other. Well, I must say the guidelines are changing. Guidelines are changing very fast. Um, when you are given option between uh, guidelines and the uh, standard textbook, I must say you must stick to the uh, standard textbooks. The guidelines changing very fast, right? When the question says most likely, 
the question is not very clear to me can can that student uh, ask me that question please yes sir yeah. Saipa. what do you want to know about that if a question is asked a question is asking to choose the most likely uh, cause for the uh, stems and i see the most likely cause is missing and the rest of the five the all five stems mentioned in the questions are equally uh, waiting waiting so in that case how to choose yeah in that case uh, again this is the problem with uh, or rather difficulty in uh, best of five questions as i said the answers are generally similar so you have to go through the stem again and uh, range your answers from the least likely to the most likely like what i did in my question in the middle part of my presentation then you have to go that. so that's why the these uh, best of equations are more difficult than true false questions so you have to find out the best answer among five with the from the have a range like least likely to the most likely when we are asked to select initial management option should we select the best management step of that particular diagnosis or the usual initial setup like giving normal cell line in the blood profile mm. best initial management it depends on the case actually uh, you have to answer according to the ideal setup now say in that question i gave you a patient with malignant hypertension now coming with uh, coming with uh, high blood pressure in that case the answer is actually you have to give uh, parenteral antihypertensive drugs to bring down the blood pressure so that's the answer for those questions right another question two patient um when we do uh, past papers the answers for some questions are uh, can you can can you can you can i ask that student to ask that question please uh, it's not very clear to me again someone is asking a question when they ask about the best management what should be marked the management in the textbook or the management in the prof unit the answer is management in the textbook not in the prof unit so remember that because you are tested on your knowledge and these are questions these questions are set by various examiners working in various places and um, so your questions are set by examiners uh, from various faculties so so you have to go by the ideal management given in the textbook not in the prof in it okay right yeah one more question coming so is it advisable uh, in uh, true false questions if we can't find the answer in the standard textbooks or lecture notes but we find it only research finding do we take the answer yes that's why i said you may get some you have to be uh, um uh, you have to read in medicine and you have to be uh, updated in your knowledge with the recent literature that's why i said now and now look at that question about uh, the side effects of the covid shield vaccine and when you read the literature it doesn't say but in the recent uh, research findings suggest that some patients developed uh, thrombosis so examiners can give questions like that based on the recent findings so you have to be uh, familiar with these findings in the recent literature in management should we follow international guidelines sri lankan guidelines i would say better to go for the international guidelines but if the, the question is based mainly on sri lankan asking about sri lanka like the management of tuberculosis related to sri lankan setup like that so 
uh, it may not change, but so the questions in the question is related to the Sri Lankan setup. Yes, follow Sri Lankan guidelines, but otherwise I would say it's better to go over the intention guidelines. Do we have to read the latest edition of the textbooks? I would say yes, because the medicine is fast changing. And so whenever possible, you must read the latest edition of the textbook. That's the purpose of having these editions coming once in four years, two years. So I, I recommend that you must read the latest edition because the questions are sometime based on the recent edition like recognized. Recognized means even a recent reported one case is enough. When you get an answer like it occurs in the disease means even a one or two cases is enough. So you get this information in mainly in sometimes in new editions. In emerging situation, best management option would be steps in ABC or definitive management. I would say um, in ABC, yeah, most emerging situation ABC is the most important. And then you, later only you talk about definitive management. Any other questions? Excuse me, yes, sir. You can ask me. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, first of all, uh, I should thank you uh, for spending your uh, valuable time for us, sir. Thank uh, you. Sir, question. Uh, in uh, MCQ paper, uh, yeah. are we always asking about the typical percentage of the diseases, sir? Yes, generally, uh, generally, uh, yes, typical, actually. Now, now, when you look at the MCQ paper, I said at the beginning, um, you are, you are not, your deep knowledge is tested here. So that's why you need to read a lot, read deeper on subjects. And actually, you, you should know the typical pattern. Yeah, I, yeah, the answer is the typical. You must have a knowledge about the typical pattern. And there are questions sometimes on atypical pattern, but generally your knowledge is tested on the, tested on the common pattern, the typical pattern. Thank you, sir. Right, okay. Answers for this sum, all questions didn't find the latest edition, but didn't found it. Yeah, so in that case, now the student is asking that the uh, answers for the, um, for some MCQ questions are found in uh, all editions, not in the new ones. So in that case, yes, certainly yes. Because now um, when I, I have the actual, I always collect these textbooks. I also find it. But when you uh, get the latest edition, when that latest edition uh, does, not, does not contain certain facts, it doesn't mean that the facts are invalid. The facts can be still valid and they don't include in the, the new edition uh, for the simple reason of uh, not having uh, enough space actually. But so you can still lose that knowledge when you answer your question. It's a good question. Yeah, one student is asking how many MCQs should be marked at least to get 45% uh, is I don't, I can't, uh, I can't give a definite answer uh, because now it depends on your uh, mark in the uh, essay paper. Say that you have done very well in the essay paper, uh, getting a very good mark. So in the MCQ paper, you don't need to get a big mark. So it depends on the two papers actually. So that's the answer for that question. Uh, in MCQs, do they give very rare diseases as answers in best choice questions? Very rarely you get very rare diseases. With my experience, we normally set question based on commonly seen conditions. The very rare diseases are very rare in the MCQ paper. Right. Anything else? Any other question? So, so uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so when they ask about a uh, subcategory of disease like in Crohn disease, Yes. And they are asking about characteristic features. Uh, it's a true and false question. 
Yeah. Uh, so when we think about that, uh, should we go only for the features that no, are? No, the thing is the characteristic feature means actually um, in that that's mainly you get in best of five. When you are they asking only one answer, no. What is the characteristic characteristic feature means? It's uh, you can't uh, create uh, true false questions. No? Am I correct? If you're asking only one answer, characteristic yeah. feature means only one answer. So the this question has to be a best of five, not true false. Am I correct? Uh, right. It's a question I uh, came up. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's asking about uh, uh, characteristic features in a true and false question. Well, yeah. I don't know. Uh, then probably only yeah, it's not a good uh, true and false. It has to be if they are testing your knowledge on a characteristic feature, it has to be a best of five, not true false, right? Right. Okay. Then then uh, once someone is asking about uh, uh, the fifty questions you get in the paper, common yes. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, I could not uh, tell you about this. The paper that you get in the final MBBS is a common paper. Every year we prepare two papers and um, all the faculties get together. We have about eight state faculties. We meet in one center. We sometimes spend days and days discussing questions. We prepare only one paper and that paper is given to the faculties, all the state faculties at the same time. So the MCQ paper is conducted every 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 year. I think it is conducted in the morning hours. It's nine to eleven. So that we can't change, right? Okay. Any other questions? The clinicals can change. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, um, it looks like no other questions. So I want to thank, uh, there are two more questions. In emergency management, what is the best reference? Well, I can't give you a definite answer. There is a good uh, textbook, rather book written by the our colleagues in uh, Ruhuna Medical Faculty. That's a very good one. Even um, when we were students and even during our postgraduate training, we used to read that one. That's a very good one. Um, how does the marks take for common MCQs? You are putting me in trouble. I can't give you the exact answer. And uh, I'm not here to make that, to give that answer. And in fact, we are not aware how this is done, but what I know is the bulk of the marks are taken uh, from the MCQ paper. So that's why I said, you need to have a good mark in the MCQ paper. Um, you're asking me about the calculation, merit calculation. I do not know. I'm sorry about that. I'm no, I have no idea about this calculation. None of us, I think most academics are not aware about this calculation process. But what I can tell you confidently is the bulk of the marks are taken from the MCQ. So try to do well in the MCQ paper. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll. Uh, no, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Shall you tell the. Tushar, anything else you want to add now? This question about MCQ paper. Actually, you and me, we have no idea. No, Tushar. And. Um, yeah. yeah. You want to say yeah, anything? About um, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, the, the common merit is uh, made uh, using both uh, your MCQs and the clinical mark. Yeah. But as uh, Sir said, the bulk of the the total mark comes from the MCQs. MCQ, yes, so it's uh, very important that you uh, do well in your MCQs uh, if you're going to get a good mark in, rank in your um, uh, island merit merit order. Yeah. And Tushara, uh, one more point about, uh, I think uh, I think we can make this uh, open now. 
this, the, 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 the just passed out students, they have done well, I think, compared to the previous batch, no? the MCQ paper. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, and the, the dean has informed us. I think uh, the, the I think all the department uh, took an uh, took a great effort to help these MCQs. You no, know? I think uh, probably that may have helped them. And these uh, the, the, the just passed out students, their MCQs are better than the previous uh, batch. You no, know? so we can be happy to share. Yeah, certainly, yes, certainly, yes. And I hope these uh, PEMSA activities will help to some extent to for you to get a good mark. So I want to thank PEMSA. So my humble request again, join PEMSA whenever possible, no, Tushar, the students. Yes, certainly. Now, even last time I uh, made this appeal to uh, yes. for students to make uh, become uh, associate members and all the details are in the, um, uh, forget the website, the, the PEMSA website. So uh, I hope uh, most of you will join and uh, so get the benefit that, that that you can pass on your the benefits that you gain now to your your juniors. I mean, we can you can do a lot. Um, sir. Yes. Manoji. Ah yes, Manoji. Yes. <laughs> sir, uh, a few more things. Um, and uh, it is better to advise them to mark uh, best of five answers. Yes. I mean, each and every uh, re yeah. uh, question. Manoji, Manoji they... can, can I can I say? I think uh, now the students, they, you should know that Manoji is, uh, and she has been marking this MCQ paper for so many years. Manoji, why don't you tell them? You are the best no, no. person to tell them. Please, please. No, no. When, when, when they are marking the best of five uh, questions, it yeah. is better to mark even, even, even you can guess and mark because uh, it doesn't carry any minor marks or yeah. minus marks are not uh, carrying. So therefore, don't uh, keep it blank because sometimes your guesses may be correct. So therefore, it is better to mark the best of five. Mm -hmm. And the true false ones, I mean, if you are sure about three answers, better not take any chances. But if you don't know any answer, better try it and see because the minus marks will not carry for the question to question. It, it is only within the question. In the question. Yeah. Thank you, Manoji, your input. I think you have been marking these papers for so many years. Ago, so thank you very much for your input. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope they will take it very seriously. So Tushar, anything else? I think we have come to the end. No, it looks like uh, they don't have any questions. Yeah, probably. yeah. I think you have you given your um, uh, WhatsApp number and your email. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they'll uh, make use of that. Yeah, most. I'm. I'm sure they are most. Um, very, um, they can join me at any time with WhatsApp or email, ask me any question. So ask them to contact me at any time if they have doubts. I'm very happy to help them. Okay. So with that, we'll uh, call it a day. So thank you very much, sir, taking your time. And uh, I'm sure students have gained a lot. And uh, hope you will uh, um, help them with a um, few more sessions with time to come. And your students, uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, all the best you. We'll meet uh, maybe a couple of days time. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you Sarah. Thank you, Manoji. And thank you, okay. students, for joining. Okay, good night. Have good a night. safe.